thank you very much. Thank you to the to the organizers. Uh, and it's been very intriguing, uh, very humbling uh, experience over the past few days listening to all these wonderful papers and performances. Um, it is 1959, and we are in New York. In we are in New York City. Josh, sorry, can you speak up a little bit more? Speak up, yes, sir. Okay. It is 1959, and we are in New York City, in the Lower East Side apartment of jazz bassist Scott LaFaro. Ornette Coleman has just come to visit as part of a burgeoning musical friendship with LaFaro, who will go on to play and record two major albums as bassist in Coleman's band before his, LaFaro's, untimely death in a car accident. In the middle of a wide-ranging discussion of music, technique, and improvisation, Coleman asks LaFaro what the tonic note of his instrument is. LaFaro doesn't understand the question. How can the bass have a single tonic note? He says, compositions have tonic notes, not instruments. Adding, I can play the bass in whatever key I need to, in whatever key the music needs me to. The instrument takes you where the music needs you to go, doesn't it? After a pause, Coleman says, I see what you mean, but I don't think the instrument goes anywhere. It's already there. <laughs> <laughs> this paper represents a start toward a larger project of theorizing a place for the instrument in the context of new materialist philosophies. I would like to make a case for the musical instrument as a thing, that is, a material entity that ought not be reduced to the status of a mere object passively operated by a human subject, but rather something that to say it with Jane Bennett in her book, Vibrant Matter, uh, possesses its own vitality, an elusive, recalcitrant quality or vibrancy that paradoxically excludes and invites my relation to it. I want to explore the conditions in which the vibrant materiality of an instrument radically interposes itself between the aesthetic intentions of a composer or performer on the one hand, and the sounds that the instrument will produce on the other that is, to explore the agency of musical instruments in composition and performance. We might initially understand the musical instrument as a kind of tool whose physical characteristics correspond more or less directly to a set of acoustic possibilities that composers, musicians, and listeners alike can take for granted. A fixed range of pitches, tones, and timbres that clearly demarcate, say, a saxophone from a violin, and thereby, thereby form the somewhat tautological basis for using or hearing the violin as a violin, the saxophone as a saxophone, etc. But when the conventions of our listening habits and playing techniques are detuned and retuned, not to a pre-given idea, but to an open-ended reciprocal relationship between a player and an acoustic thing, our task of making and listening to sound and music must be continually reinvented in what I would call an environment of instrumentality, the ceaseless sounding of the interplay of human and non-human agencies and materialities that we might otherwise call music. Experimental or extended playing techniques, the alteration or preparation of existing instruments, and the invention of new instruments altogether, this all has a long history in 20th and 21st century music, which I cannot engage here. But what I will attempt to do is focus on a single instrument, the double bass, the best instrument, <laughs> and, and, and a single recording, uh, the 1994 album Was Da Ist by German bassist Peter Kowald, uh, to argue by way of analysis and some speculation that Kowald, Kowald does not use the instrument to make music, but rather uses music to make the instrument. That is, to render audible the materiality of, of the bass, Was Da Ist, what's there uh, in the instrument over and against the musicality of tone and the aesthetics of expression. <laughs> now, before we get started, we should perhaps behave like good musicians, stop the warm-up, and have a general tune. But as we will hear, uh, this conventional practice immerses us uh, right away in the problem of the double bass. <laughs>
first we hear a sustained tone plucked repeatedly on the lowest open string of the bass, a growly resonant sound that seems to descend more deeply with each iteration. Kowalt is literally detuning the, the string as he plays it until it reaches a point where the quality of the sound radically shifts. The musical tone of the double bass devolves abruptly into the mere noise of a long steel wire flapping against a piece of ebony. But in the next instant, the string is tightened just so, back up to the point where an audible tone uh, returns to the sound. Kowald tunes the string to its tonal limit, the point where the maximum of noise, here the metallic flapping and popping, can coexist with the minimum of bass tone. The actual pitch is irrelevant. What matters is establishing a kind of tonal ground of his instrument, perhaps what Coleman meant by the tonic note of the instrument. Such a tonic note wouldn't be tonic at all in the strict sense, but rather would represent the point where the materiality of the instrument merges with the tonality of its expression. It is not a point uh, determined by pitch and Western music notation, but only by the wood, metal, and resonance of the instrument itself. Having located this tonal ground, Koval then retraces the downward journey in a sequence of descending half steps, executed by uptuning, fingering, detuning the lowest string back to ground zero. The piece concludes with five punchy hits that deliver a stubborn, disarmingly complex sound of steel, wood, finger, percussive snap, and harmonic resonance. Taking detuning literally, again, we might ask, what is the lowest note on a double bass anyway? Conventionally, it is a low E. But since so much of Western classical music asks the bass to double the cello on the lower octave, hence the name double bass, or German contrabass, Italian contrabasso, um, the bass is regularly, regularly expected to play up to two full steps below its supposedly lowest note to double the cello's uh, low C. As a result, most professional bassists either add an extra string to their instrument, a low B, just to be on the safe side, or they install an extension on the top of the fingerboard, uh, which allows them to hit the desired notes. A growing number of bassists, particularly in Toronto, as I understand it, uh, retune the instrument altogether, tuning the strings in fifths, uh, just like the cello, which is, as opposed to the conventional fourths, a convention which is itself subject to wide historical variation. In a pinch, another strategy is to detune the string as needed, quickly and quietly during an actual performance. My point here is that musical evolution has not yet settled on a final or fixed tuning for the bass. Even the number of strings is up for grabs, not to mention other aspects of the construction of the instrument. The double bass is the only bowed instrument in the orchestra whose physical specifications are still in a state of flux and for which extended techniques and preparation of the instrument in a kind of proto cajun sense hardly belong to the esoteric, esoteric domain of 20th century art music. And so Koval's exploratory procedure of locating the tonal ground of his instrument in fact resonates with an ongoing problem in the construction and playing of the bass that goes back for hundreds of years. Koval in fact allows us to hear an aspect of the double bass's evolution its thingliness, and explore its noise tone threshold at the same time. Other tracks on Was Da Ist explore further territories along the bass's noise tone frontier. Kowald devotes pieces to extreme high notes, double stops, harmonics, drones, wolf tones, and other sounds that probably don't have a name yet. Uh, Kowald's bowing technique frequently involves playing behind and between the strings, at and below the bridge, as well as exerting a vertical scraping pressure along the axis of the strings in addition to bowing across them. His playing seems at times consumed with the need to play every note and string at once to make the entire sonic range of the instrument resonate simultaneously through both gymnastic leaps of the left hand and a perpetual circular bowing movement with the right. Other tracks are more austere, exploring the sonic qualities of a single sustained bowed note for minutes on end. But I would suggest that what unifies the other very, otherwise a very different sounding and differently conceived 23 pieces on the album is a subtle descending quality. Kowald's playing renders audible the gravity 
of the instrument, its physical and sonic weight, resting heavily, if uneasily, on the tonal ground we heard before. Even in tracks like this one, where one is hard pressed to hear anything that resembles a bass tone, we can hear a steady, if as if inevitable, downward movement. And here I'm going to play just the opening about 20 seconds at the concluding 20 seconds of, of uh, what is called, helpfully, part two or track two on, on the record. No, t no titles on any of them. by a quick flurry of notes that ends in another groan, slightly lower on the fingerboard. It is as if the sound is attempting to ascend the scale, climbing, slipping, learning how to fall with style, uh, scrambling back up, uh, slipping again, and so forth, until, growing desperate, its movements uh, become more and more frantic before the release or the exhaustion of the open strings ends the piece. Because of the structural tension of playing high-pitched notes on a low-pitched instrument, the breath-like quality of the playing is, I think, particularly remarkable, as is the gasp-like quality of the piece's conclusion. Yet, alongside the musical content of the piece, we also hear the snapping and attack of the bow itself, and the micro-pauses between the up and down bows, the, the interstices of the bowing. In other words, the intense physicality of the playing is heard as an inextricable part of the music itself. The duality of listening to how the sounds are made versus listening to the sounds themselves characterizes the following piece as well. We'll hear just the first 30 seconds. <laughs> As the pitch descends, screaming past us like a siren caught in an impossibly slow Doppler effect. Yet for all its seeming aggression, it is hard to dismiss the fragility of the tone here, the strange interplay of, of screeching and vulnerability rendered by the contrasting speed of Kovald's bow. In the final piece I'd like us to listen to, I want to return to the notion of vibrancy that is, I argue, or rather I speculate, uh, sounded in the materiality of the bass by Koval's complex mixing of tone and noise. This piece, just over a minute and a half in length, opens with a kind of pizzicato strumming of the open strings, harsh and throbbing in tone, against which a very precise, high-pitched hammering sound emerges. Koval develops this contrast to a breathtaking sonic extreme. So this is now just one, one and a half minutes, and it's the last one. Thank you. 
clinking sound of the hammered strings shares the sonic space uneasily with the murky undertones, each sound competing for our attention until the pitch and speed of the hammering suddenly increase, shooting into the upper limits of our oral perception. This effect is dramatic enough, but what is more important is how Kowald handles the incidental noises that arise. We continue to hear the open strings resonating in sympathy, but at a certain point in the track, Kowald abruptly dampens them, and we hear a hummingbird-like whirring against the deep, quiet rumbling of the body of the bass itself. Kowald's hammering is at this point purely percussive and beyond the plinking sound produces no significant vibrational action in the strings. But in hammering through the string onto the fingerboard, he makes us hear the sound of the bass vibrating without the strings. A pulsating or pulsing, indistinct, <coughs> utterly open tone that is essentially the audible dimension of the bass's material structure. The sound of its body and the empty space in and around it. Kowald allows us to hear what is otherwise unplayed and unplayable in the body of the instrument, eliciting sounds that emerge only indirectly, only by contrast to that high-pitched hammering, but that allow us to hear the sonic potential of the bass that is, that is always there, was da ist, uh, if unheard, accompanying and enabling any and every sound that is to be played on it. In, in physics, in classical mechanics, there, there is a concept, uh, so I understand, I was terrible at physics. But. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a concept called a normal, normal force. This is my high school physics coming, coming back to me, to haunt me or something. Um, which is a, a kind of component force that arises in the surface of an object when it comes into contact with another object against gravity. It is not a question of one body smashing into another, as in a collision, but rather describes how two bodies produce a shared force through their interaction in a given situation. For example, when I put my cup on the table, right, the normal force emerges as the counterforce that's embedded in the material structure of the table, which allows it to withstand the weight of the cup and keep it from crashing to the floor. So the normal force is in the table, imminent to it, but it isn't there until I put my cup on it. And as soon as I remove the cup, the normal force vanishes. But it will be there again as soon as I put the cup back. The notion of normal force thus describes a non-exertional, non-reactional, non-vector that resists gravity without actually doing anything, that is built into the material structure of the table, but only activated or actuated by an external body, here the cup, which itself could just as easily be said to be the agent of that force as the table that supports it. If I stay true to my premise that musical instrumentality is sustained theoretically by the sonic entanglement of human and non-human agency and materiality, then somewhere in the garbled mechanics of my high school physics metaphor uh, <laughs> lies another metaphor for what uh, Kowald does for the bass and <clears throat> vice versa. His playing is an interaction of two bodies, each fighting an inevitable gravity, reaching down to the ground and standing back up on it, in and through the sounds that emerge at the tone, uh, tone noise limit where the noisy materiality of the bass meets the metaphorical transporting quality of musical tone, we hear, as it were, the normal force of the sounding bodies themselves, bass instrumentality, as an immersive vibrational environment, unplayed yet resonating, physical yet untouchable. The bass is detuned, detoned, and if you like, detonated. <laughs> that is, made to thunder, which is the root of the word to detonate. Only it is a quiet, uh, vibrant thunder not accompanied by a sudden illumination of lightning, but resonating precisely in the shadows where human agency blurs into the agency of the thing called an instrument. I'd like to close with, with an excerpt from a kind of a prose poem that Kowald wrote for the liner notes uh, to Vasda is. Uh, the following is a kind of statement of his, of his method or, or his practice in composing and executing the performances on the record. Here's the quote. A big sack, which can also be a burden, from which I take everything onto the table. 
What I leave out, exclude, becomes a problem. Better draw everything in. Selecting, separating comes later. Like air, rain, sun, cold, warmth. What's always there, spread out before me. In eye contact, not to be overlooked. In ear contact, not to be overheard. Only, not everything lies in the angle of the ears. There is also a no man's land of perception. Black stains, dark fields. Thank you.